Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series on the living world. Now, you can breathe a sigh of relief. We are almost done with this series. We've got a couple on the nervous system, and then we're done. So today's topic is going to be the organization of the nervous system and resting potential in neurons. Like always, let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. So by the end of this video, here's stuff you need to know. First thing, describe the organization of the nervous system and then describe the structure of a neuro uh, sorry and then describe the structure of a neuron and finally explain the concept of resting potential so before we can actually start talking about the nervous system we need to talk about its organization and information flow first the flow of information so you can see three points down there at the bottom basically information in the nervous system flows in this direction you have sensory input so your body receives some sort of stimuli from the outside world that stimuli then flows to the central nervous system for integration, which is where it's basically interpreted and analyzed, and then there is some motor output or response. So input, integration, output, that's how things flow in the nervous system. And regarding structure and organization, the nervous system is basically divided into two parts. You get the central nervous system, CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, which is the PNS. Central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system is all of the uh, sensory nerves and everything else that run out into the rest of the body. So once you get away from that spinal cord, you are now into the peripheral nervous system. And obviously, most information is going to be carried on those uh, peripheral nervous system. Uh, neurons and then it'll be carried to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is where the processing happens and then it sends information back out to the peripheral nervous system to actually get some work done. So throughout this series we're going to talk about CNS and PNS central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. Now the workhorse of the nervous system is a type of cell called a neuron. And neurons are really very interesting in their structure and function both. So Basic parts of a neuron first are as follows. You have got the cell body, which is this piece right here. And cell body is basically where all the organelles are. It's where the nuclei are. Now notice I said nuclei. Um, neurons can have multiple nuclei in them. And it's the kind of the central hub that everything attaches to. Branching directly off of the cell body are dendrites. The purpose of a dendrite is to receive a signal from another neuron or from some sensory cell. So if we're talking about inputs and outputs, this is where the input comes in. The input comes in through the dendrite. Cell body processes that input and then it sends the signal out through an axon. And usually an axon is one really long branch. And then at the end of the axon, it branches out again and at the end of the axon on these branches, there are places where the axon branch meets up with another cell. That is called a synapse. We'll talk about synapses later on. Know that the uh, axon are wrapped by uh, cells called Schwann cells. And these are essentially insulator cells. Schwann cells are a part of or a type of cell called a glial cell. And glial cells, the purpose of them is to provide like support and insulation and nourishment for these uh, neurons. Um, they also, especially the swan, sorry, swan cells, the swan cells um, that wrap around the axons speed up nerve conduction. So that is the structure of a neuron. Hey, sorry for that edit in there. I got my notes a little bit out of order. So now that we've talked a little bit about the neuron structure, let's go ahead and talk about what a neuron is up to when it is at rest. And while a neuron is at rest, it has something called resting potential. And what resting potential is, is it's a difference in charge between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. The cell has got some machinery in it that actively pump sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell. And it's also got some things called ion channels that also allow uh, ions to kind of freely diffuse back and forth. Um, here's kind of what you've got going on. You've got a situation where sodium is being pumped out fairly quickly. You got potassium being pumped in. And on the next slide, I'll talk about some details of this. And you've also got channels that allow sodium to flow out, but the channels that allow uh, 
or sorry, that allow potassium to flow out, but the channels that allow sodium to flow in usually remain closed. So because you have got a difference in which ion is pumped to which side, you actually end up with a situa situation where the inside of the cell is electrically negative when compared to the outside of the cell. And that's going to be really important in a minute. But that difference in charge across the membrane is known as the resting potential. That resting potential is going to provide the ability to do work, which I will talk about that next. So a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of how we form a resting potential in a neuron. So here's what you've got going on. Generally, as far as like net goes, where there is the most of each, you've got sodium inside the cell. And though sodium, or sorry, K is potassium, you've got potassium inside the cell. And though potassium is a positive ion, proportionally speaking, it is more negative than sodium is. So you've got potassium inside the cell, you've got sodium outside. The inside of the cell is negative, the outside of the cell is positive. And part of this is the result of the sodium potassium pump. Now, if you remember way back when we talked about diffusion, everything wants to float down its diffusion gradient from high to low. If you are going against that gradient, you are using active transport, which means that you're actually spending ATP to move uh, ions or particles or whatever in a direction that they do not want to go. So there's a pump called the sodium-potassium pump. And that sodium-potassium pump uses the energy of ATP to maintain this difference of charge from one side to the next. It makes sure that you have plenty of potassium inside the cell and plenty of sodium outside of the cell. And it does that by pumping three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. Now, also in that membrane, you've got ion channels. And because you've got a situation where there are all kinds of gradients going on, you've got an electrical gradient where you've got negative inside the cell and positive outside the cell. And you've also got a chemical gradient where you've got a lot of sodium inside, or yeah, a lot of uh, potassium inside and a lot of sodium outside. The fact that those things want to diffuse back and forth to create equilibrium can be uh, capitalized on by the cell through these ion channels. As those ions, the uh, positive potassium and the positive sodium, flow back and forth, they can carry electrical charge with them. And as they flow through those ion channels, the ion channel can grab some of that electrical charge and use it to do work um, in sending a signal down a neuron. We'll talk about that in a later video. But just recognize that these little machines called ion channels are able to capture some of that electrical energy to do work. Final slide for the day. Um, when we are at rest or when your neuron is at rest, it's not sending a signal, it's not releasing a signal, it's just kind of hanging out there. Um, the sodium potassium pump in combination with the diffusion across the ion channels results in a membrane ch potential of negative 60 to negative 80 millivolts. That means that the difference from one side of the cell to the other is 60 to 80 millivolts. And like I said just a second ago, that difference in electrical charge is what is going to be used to send a signal down the neuron and that will get its own video later on. So I hope that wasn't too rambly and convoluted for you. Sorry for the uh, edit in the middle. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.